By the time I finish saying this sentence, 35 billion people will die. This is a video about doom scrolling, but if you don't mind, I'm not gonna start with the stuff that I think we've all heard a lot by now. Doom scrolling's bad, it's all the media's fault, algorithms prioritize outrage. Instead, I would like to start this video about doom scrolling with a story about the week that my daughter was born. But first, click on this. All I want in this whole life it is the end of the world as we know. Gender, race, sexuality. This is an outrage. China unleashed COVID on the People world. People are dying. Work all day to half past five. Chain link fence and gravel drive. Trust in the mass media. Online, online media. Is at its lowest point since 2016. Record breaking drought. What size is your cover? It don't sound like much, but it sure is. When did the thought first come to you that perhaps our time as mankind on Earth was limited? Huge thanks to Delete Me for sponsoring this piece, more on them later. The first time I ever held my daughter, still when I hold my daughter, it is the greatest feeling that the world has ever given me. The birth itself was traumatic. We had a little bit of a... I mean, I had the easiest role of the three of us. Mama. But it was something else. There was quite a few medical complications. And we nearly lost her. If I did it the other way, would we have a baby by now? Baby. Eventually, my wife Felicity had to have an emergency C-section at 3 in the morning. And despite all of the chaos at 3.51 a.m., we met our daughter and she was perfect. Now, while I could fill a whole book on just what that first week was like, there's only one moment that we need to look at for this story. For the story of doom scrolling. A few days into being new parents, I took this photo and I posted it. Like, yay. Half out of pride, half out of, hey, I will not be writing back to any messages for a hot minute. As you can imagine, a whole lot of lovely people were saying lovely things, lots of congrats, lots of welcome to the world, little baby, that kind of stuff. And then right there in the middle of all of these comments sits this one. Ooh, baby, look at this one. Isn't this a freaking pearl up? We got one in the wild. Nice timing. I'm sure that baby will love experiencing climate apocalypse and water wars. Couldn't possibly have adopted a baby in need. Hell yes. Apparently I'm the worst person ever. All environmental problems, that's on me guys. Sorry about that one. My bad. Won't happen again. Me, my wife who couldn't walk for the next six weeks, and our three day old child, we managed to cause the water wars. Now these are pretty easy arguments to pick apart, but to be fair, they're also pretty logical things to assume. I mean, the equation makes sense. One more person, especially in a developed country, is one more person's worth of problems. Therefore, more people, more bad. So the next time you see a baby, punch it in the face. But what if population growth is the least influential part of the climate change equation? And if we're not punching babies, who should we punch? Who's doing the damage here? Well, it's probably those 100 companies that are making 71% of all global emissions. Public thinks the recycling is working, then they're not going to be as concerned about the environment. Meanwhile, the population's growth rate is steadily declining, and the population itself is projected to peak in 2086. Don't get me wrong, I'm on your side. The anger is justified, and it's potentially world-changing, if it's directed at corporate and political greed, and not literal babies. This graph here, for example, says that if the US operated at a German level of efficiency when it came to the environment, this would have a bigger impact than preventing 100 million Americans from existing. Meanwhile, other people point out that overpopulation is often a dog whistle for eugenics. Others note that our attention would be much more useful on global female empowerment. But my favorite argument comes from John Stewart. There's one really easy thing you could do to green your life, and that's not have a child. <laughs> Exactly are we saving the earth for? But the thing about this commenter is that there's nothing special about them. This isn't an isolated incident. It's something that we all see every day. There is a certain type of person who sees any comment section, doesn't matter what the content is, as an opportunity to spit their own brand of doom-fueled venom. What's up with that? It could be like a freaking video of a puppy in flowers and the comments will always be like, so cute, I love that puppy, I can't afford a puppy, I love puppies. Puppies are Hitler. 
here we go. That comment's usually got 96 replies and you read them because who wants a good day anyway? And within three comments, there's just a bunch of people, all of their usernames are like Wi-Fi passwords. And they've managed to turn Puppies of Hitler into a think piece about abortion. By the 10th comment, everyone's on gun control. Then it's race, religion, politics, until it's just trans people and sport and then paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs about 5G. But I mean, that makes sense. Puppies are Hitler. Another person says, I am angry that things like this happen. I get mad about every bullshit thing I see. So obviously a lot of opinions there to make this story seem somewhat meaningful. But facts and angry people aside, there are two questions that I really want to dig into in this video. The first, why is doom everywhere? Why is it so prevalent? And the second, what do you do about it? To answer these questions, I want to take a look at what doom scrolling was like before the internet. In the 1960s, this young scientist, a guy called Paul, alongside his wife, who was weirdly uncredited, wrote and published a book that would change their lives forever. The book was called The Population Bomb, and it sold millions of copies. It was all about how the world was going to hell in a handbasket, and that the key culprit was overpopulation. While you are reading these words, four people, most of them children, will die of starvation, and 24 more babies will have been born. Paul Elrich argued that by the 1970s we'd basically all be toast, and then by the 80s, if any of us were still around, we'd be double toast. The battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death, in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. Paul Elrich had a particular flair when he wrote his arguments. Instead of boring academic scientific rigour, if I were a gambler, I would take even money that England will not exist in the year 2000. His word choice was a lot more... eye-catching. You just gotta remember this, there's no way out of the arithmetic. There will never be 7 billion people in the year 2000. What disasters do you see if we don't change our ways? Well, we're losing 10 to 20 million people a year to, de to starvation right now. That's a big disaster already, and that will inevitably increase. It may now not increase next year. speaking worldwide. Worldwide. Side note, Paul was not correct. This red line here is the global population, and these blue bars are deaths from famine. You'll notice that between the 1960s, when he wrote his book, and the 1970s, when we were all going to die, there is a big drop. We'll get to why that happened later, but first, let's just take a second to be grateful that Paul wasn't right. So you think he might come forward and just be like, my bad, kind of like when I cause global warming, right? You think he might take responsibility for his incorrect predictions? Nah, of course not. Instead, he doubled down. One of the amusing but sad things about the population bomb was that it was much too optimistic a book. I don't see how India could possibly feed 200 million more people by 1980. Think about the things that we didn't know about in 1968 when it was uh, published. You know what? Paul's got a good point. Because uh, in 1968, something else was going on. Paul wasn't the only person thinking about global famines. So was this guy, Norman Borlaug. Norman was a biologist who invented a new type of wheat that even when it was grown in the harshest environments was still four times more productive than wheat had ever been before. While Paul is writing about how bad things are, Norman actually went to India with his wheat. And in just a few years, India was not just producing enough food for themselves, but enough to start exporting. Norman's wheat and the incredible effect that it had on the world is known as the Green Revolution. While Paul changed the words and reprints of his book, Norman changed the world. But while I talk about Paul's negative side, it's important to remember that Paul had a solution as well. If that doesn't work, uh, then you'll have the government legislating the size of the family. And people say, oh, that's impossible. Government can never intrude and tell you how many children to have. Well, I got news. You know, it intruded a long time ago and told you how many wives you can have. Uh, and there's not the slightest question that if we don't get the population under control with voluntary means, that in the not too distant future, the government will simply tell you how many children you can have and throw you in jail if you have too many. Now, just to be clear, Paul still has fans around the world. He is intelligent, he is well-spoken, but so are lots of his critics. And the harsh majority often say that Paul is engaging in a grift, a grift known as doomslinging. Thanks to the negativity bias, alarmist non-fiction tends to get our collective attention. So watch to the end, or die in three days, baby. And that's the grift. If you want attention, just package up your message with doom. Otherwise, the population will continue growing until we have a collapse. Do you think Paul's a grifter? I haven't quite made up my mind. I don't find him very humble, but I do think you've got a lot of people thinking about issues that they would otherwise ignore. And besides, as sensationalist as Paul and Anne's career have been, they are far far from the worst offenders. 
But we all know who is. This brand new research by Gallup says American trust in the mass media is at its lowest point since 2016 and near a record low overall. The news media, ha ha ha, yuck. You're exactly right. It's hard to escape. This is an outrage. Outrage. It's the most nonsensical thing I've ever heard of. This is where we find the answer to our first question. Why is doom so prevalent? Traditional news organizations lowering the bar of what's news in a chase for what makes people click. Because doom through attention is money. But how much? How much is doom worth to the news? There's this pretty famous study that was done by a newspaper, an online newspaper in Russia called The City Reporter, wherein for one day they decided that they would post positive news. Ah, we all know where this one goes. Instead of reporting on everything that's gonna kill you, they reported on things that were happening but weren't that alarming. And they lost two thirds of their readership that day. Two freaking thirds. Outside of the city reporter, you have the entire media machine, be that social media or mainstream media. And to lose two thirds of your attention, two thirds of your readership, is to also lose two thirds of your income. Advertisers don't care if you don't have the eyeballs to sell. And who are they selling? You and me, baby. Us. This is an equation we are all very, very familiar with by now. We all know that we are the product. But where it gets really, really bad is when you realize just how useless bad news is for everybody but the media machine. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about something else. A relevant problem, it is the sponsor, but it's also very much linked to that thing that got said before. We are the product. What do you do if you don't want to be sold anymore? Delete me, you delete yourself. You ever feel like the internet knows you just a little bit too well, then not in a good way? Like the things that you think about end up as the ads on your phone? Yeah man, data brokers, creepy internet salesmen. They're selling your data, your address, your phone number, your email. I wonder if they sell your search history. So if you're like me and you don't want your actual data to be leaked with the world, if you don't want to get doxxed or scammed, if that is a concern of yours when using the internet, then it is time to take control. Delete me, do what they say they do on the box. They help delete all of the personal details that a data broker has the details that they're selling and they actually do a pretty decent job here's a small sample of some of the places they'll delete your data from this is handy this is good this is someone fighting the good fight so if this is something you're interested in then check out the link join deleteme.com slash truthless and you can get 20 percent off with the code truthless and don't forget about your uncles and aunties and that because their data's getting sold then they might not be so savvy all right delete me genuinely relevant to the story that is being told When we left off, it was pretty clear that the media, as a business, was heavily reliant on Doom. And if your aim is to get views and money, then Doom is a great tool. But if your aim is to actually solve the problems that you're reporting on, then Doom is terrible. In the words of the marine biologist Nancy Knowlton, If you give people a really big problem without any way of acting on it, it leads to apathy, not action. Solutions happen when people are shown that solutions can happen. How many of you knew that most sea turtle populations were actually recovering? The general public needs this because they need to be inspired. They need to have a vision of what a future might look like that's sustainable. But beyond solutions feeling possible, people also have to want it. And ask yourself, if everybody on Earth acted like this guy in this comment all the time, would you want to save humanity? Now, while I bash the media in an ironically doom-slinging manner, it is important to mention that this is only some parts of the media. There are a lot of people who are trying to solve this problem, and a lot of people who work in journalism, a lot of people who work in tech. And one person that I admire in this space is Jody Jackson. The world is on fire, and we're all going to die. She's the founder of a company called The News Literacy Lab. I got to the point where the news made me feel so depressed about the world that I couldn't watch it anymore. And she spent basically her entire career trying to solve this problem. But feeling depressed doesn't have to be the overriding side effect from being informed. I really like Jodie Jackson. I like her integrity, I like her take, I like how she articulates things. So how do we fix this? Well, we don't stop reporting on problems, but we begin seriously reporting on solutions too. As for Jodie's solutions, when it comes to media consumption, she offers three really good ones. The first is that she prefers offline news, or news that isn't feed-based. Her thinking is that she should seek the news as opposed to the news seeking her. 
The second is that she reads slow journalism. This means that she's reading the news once a week instead of once an hour. And the third is that she opts for solutions-based news. So not just news that milks the crisis, but news that reports on large systemic solutions. But there is a huge resistance to this. With all the terrible things happening in the world, reporting on progress can be considered insensitive or irresponsible, as if it will give us a false sense of security. But this is just not true. And it's irresponsible not to, because without it, we're left with a full sense of insecurity, where we believe the world is worse than it actually is. It's a clear argument, and maybe if we had more news literacy, we'd have less comments like the one that told me that my daughter was causing the water wars. And this isn't to say that everything has improved for everyone, everywhere, at every moment. But it's to highlight that despite significant progress, many of us continue to think the world is getting significantly worse. Because that's the story we're most often told. The world is on fire and we're all going to die. I've also uh, got my own take on this and uh, if it's not too much trouble, if it's not too news illiterate, I'd love to take you through it. Alright, just how the start of this video began with a personal story, I might as well just do it again. I know I don't look it, that's a joke, but I am a former drug addict turned alcoholic. Ah, this feels like a meeting now. This feels like I can't afford therapy, so I just turned on the camera. No, the reason that I wanted to bring up addiction is because when I see comments, like the one that kicked this off, like all of the angry comments on puppy videos, I see my former self. But instead of being addicted to more white goods than a dishwasher expo, these people are addicted to doom, to negativity. And to sprinkle in just a tiny bit of academia with this anecdote, addiction to the news, in the clinical sense of the word addiction, is documented. So is internet addiction and social media addiction. But since the pandemic, the addiction to specifically doom scrolling is also now an academically studied phenomenon. In 2021, a team of researchers set out to create the first scale on which doom scrolling addiction can be measured. And they did it with a 15 point questionnaire. And I think this is really cool because, I don't know, it gives us a chance to reflect on our own addiction or lack of addiction to doom scrolling. And if you're watching this and you're wondering if you're addicted, while these questions aren't gospel, they might help you connect a couple of dots. So if you want a moment of reflection, you can pause the video here, go through them, and I'll link the paper below as well as some addiction resources. The thing that I find really helpful about this is while doom scrolling is a relatively new thing, addiction is not. So while the new thing might seem hard to solve, don't worry, because the old thing, we have plenty of tools for that. And I should know. In sobriety, there's a lot of talk about how you're not subtracting a drug from your life. You're adding sobriety. And for this reason, if for example, you're an alcoholic, it's gonna be pretty freaking hard if you wanna go to the bar still, if you wanna continue that ritual and then try to quit alcohol. Cause you'll see all these people, all the people, all your drinking buddies, and you'll just feel miserable. You'll just really notice the lack of beer in your hand. Instead, the recommendation that you hear from a lot of sobriety experts is to add something. Add something in that gap. Give yourself something to remind yourself that sobriety is an addition, not a subtraction. And I think doom's the same. In the world of doom and negativity, we're not subtracting awareness of the world. We're actually adding a more accurate worldview. A worldview that encompasses the bad and the good, altering our media consumption habits to better reflect reality. The actual reality, not the reality that just benefits a bunch of media companies. What would be your answer to this question? Over the next 15 years, do you think people around the world will be better off or worse off? This question was asked to over 26,000 people across 28 countries. And in addition to their opinion, they were also tested on their knowledge of global development. The people with the least awareness of what was going on tended to be the most cynical and most pessimistic. But the more people knew about the world and its developments, the more hope they had. Real hope informed hope. And if I was to ask you what percentage of the world's population are currently refugees, 14.5%, 4.5% or 0.5%? The answer is in fact 0.5%. 
And the bias responsible for these often incorrect answers is known as our availability bias. This is because the more often we see something, the more common we believe it to be. And obviously 0.5% is still a whole lot of people and they're real people and she's not arguing that this is good. What she's saying is that it's irresponsible to misrepresent and exaggerate negativity. So to feel less doom, one thing we can do instead of having, for example, our availability bias getting exploited by the news would be to work with our availability bias, to expose ourselves to a world that isn't hostile, to a nicer picture of the globe. Enter Dust to Digital. Dust to Digital is a project that's been going on since the late 90s. And the idea behind it is to preserve music. Music that would be otherwise lost to time. Music that is hard to find. Music like this. In the last 10 years alone, Dust to Digital, through their not-for-profit, have restored over 50,000 different pieces of music that would otherwise just be lost forever. And this makes me think of how many things are actually lost. If just this one small company can resurrect all of these things, what else are we missing out on? What else isn't getting our attention? Because everything I see from Dust to Digital is beautiful. So is it just that we forget to preserve the nice stuff? And if so, how much more nice stuff is there? What this makes me do is fill in the gaps, the question marks, the unknown unknowns with good stuff. The world has a lot of urgent problems, heartbreaking problems, but these don't get solved if we forget why we're trying to solve them, who we're trying to solve them for. This is your world, and doom is your world too, but it's the full picture that actually puts me in the headspace to do something about it, as opposed to the headspace that makes me spit venom on the post of a new parent. Can I confess something? I was originally gonna end the video there, but I can't. I got to the end of the edit and I realized something kind of messed up. That I had one-dimensionalized this commenter in the same way that I was saying he was one-dimensionalizing the world. By only calling him a doomslinger, I was effectively also being a doomslinger. And so I Googled him. I googled him and I decided to learn a lot more about him. And you know what? I found it really hard to stay mad. I can't hate him. I can't hate him. The more I learned, the more he became a human. You know what I mean? The less he became something and the more he became someone. I read his blog, man. Yeah, this guy's got a blog. I learned that he was also a former addict. I learned that he also written books, so two for two, buddy. I learned that he was disabled and that he'd actually been to prison for two years on a marijuana charge in a country where now most states don't even see it as a crime. And that's messed up. And I learned that he lost his brother in a way that I nearly lost my brother uh, last year. And look, loss and near loss are not the same. They are not comparable. I'm not saying that they are, but what I am saying is that this comment is not a comment, it's a human. It's a human who was probably having a bad day that day and what he wrote had nothing to do with me. What I realized is that by hating him, I was kind of falling into the same trap, you know what I mean? I was taking something bad and filling in all of my gaps, not with knowledge, but with a nightmare. I was just like, yep, this is my scapegoat. This is the bad thing. This is doom. 
But the reality is, Doom often doesn't survive being talked about. It's like a shadow that doesn't survive the spotlight. And this is the story of Doom Scrolling. It's the story of the world. The more we fill in the gaps properly, the less assumptions we make and the more curious we are, the less we see the doom and the more we see the actual big picture, the more we see the good things. And hopefully this will make those bad things better than doom ever could. All I want in this whole life, a little red house in a country white. It don't sound